just credit also this title, Projecting Tradition into the Future, uh, to Val Jeanfi, who is a dear friend of mine and who is going to play with Sumi Tanaka and I tomorrow. Uh, but she's a Haitian um, American electronic artist, magician. Um, and she, when I heard her do an interview, she talked about projecting her ancestry into the future. And, and that really stuck in my brain and inspired me from then till now. So I just wanted to give a shout out to her. Um, it's gonna go very, I'm gonna try to go very fast through a lot of, through 20 years of living. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, a dear, wonderful mentor, kind of a grandfather figure to me, Vaughn Freeman, uh, who left, left this earth uh, when I was in Korea uh, in 2012. And um, he taught me so much, and there's so many people that I'm not gonna be able to uh, talk about uh, in the next 30 minutes, but um, yeah, this is, I learned so much just from not only sitting in with him and talking with him on the phone and at these jam sessions at uh, the new apartment lounge in Chicago, uh, but through his recordings and um, just, you know, trying to sing like the way he played. And uh, so I'm just gonna share a little bit of uh, 1982 or 3 recording uh, that Steve Coleman shared with me as he was also Steve Coleman's mentor. It's just easy living. And when I began, like many of us jazz musicians, I, I just wanted to sing along <laughs> and match his phrasing. Seek out his recordings uh, if you haven't uh, heard his music or don't own his music. Um, so that is, uh, I'm going to kind of jump uh, from there, uh, as he, he was such a guiding light to me, um, encouraged me, just as John and Francis did, to really look at who, where I came from, uh, because that was not a question that I asked myself uh, until I met really Francis and, and John and Hafez and uh, Jenny Lim in the Bay Area um, after attending Stanford University, you know, where I was really just focused on opera singing and perfecting my Western classical tone. <laughs> um, and so, you know, when I met Francis, uh, I, I remember somehow in a conversation or some maybe a gig that he invited me to participate in, he he, you know, said, Hey, maybe you wanna check out the music, you know, maybe from your dad's side of the family, your mom's side of the family and 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 I remembered that I had these uh, like photocopies, exactly these photocopies uh, that I've scanned for you. Um, that my father, who was born in Tainan, Taiwan, uh, he had uh, given these to me before I went to Stanford. So they were stuck in a box, and my shikambu, my fourth grand auntie, had sent them to him to give to me. And so he gave them to me. I do not remember him giving them to me, but somehow I, I remembered they were in a box. And so through Stanford, never looked at them, not interested. Um, and then after graduating, um, after, you know, while I was hanging out, searching for my path, um, I remembered this when Francis kind of jogged my memory. And yes, yeah, so these are, these were photocopies actually from a book that I later got when I did get to go to Taiwan as an adult. Um, that, as you can see, it's already, uh, the left side, the, it's already notated in a Western way. So, um, 
and very beautifully, you know, the, the words and the lyrics are already typed out. So I later attained this book, um, but before I went to Taiwan, I was, I was kind of experimenting and, and doing my own arrangements of them while I was, you know, living in San Francisco and uh, get, getting to play with um, Francis and um, John Carlos Perea and Jimmy Biala and really experimenting but not knowing uh, what I was doing. And I realized that it was a very surface thing that I was doing. And I, um, I called myself out on the surfaceness and, and I, I was determined to go deeper. So um, I, I remember telling Francis in one of our many conversations, uh, you know, I really, I really want to go to Taiwan. I really need to meet my relatives that I've only seen in photographs um, and, and see this side of my dad. And at that time, my mom's side of the family, of course, was um, in Australia. And they were all born in East Timor. I couldn't go there at the time because it was still under occupation by the Indonesian government. So. That was not an option for me at the time, but the, Taiwan was. So um, I went there first, and I remember Francis saying, you know, when I kind of said, I think you'd go to Taiwan, he said, yeah, I think it'd be good to hang out there. Yeah, <laughs> just hang out. I was like, well, but I want to research the music of the, you know, Taiwanese folk music and where these songs came from and, and all the, you know, what the indigenous music sounds like. I had no idea. He's like, it's good to just hang out, you know? <laughs> and I, I really, I always value that, I, I, um, and that's exactly what I try to do, uh, aside my own musical curiosities, but more and more as I matured and continued on, you know, this path of um, very much akin with Hafez, you know, you're looking for, you're just looking for soulmates and family members, and it's ever expanding, and, uh, so I did learn how to just hang out. <laughs> but um, so I can, you know, briefly, uh, the top left corner is um, the beautiful Pisui Sio, uh, who is an Ataya, Ataya to Ataya tribe singer, who is teaching me a song um, uh, called the, uh, the Women's Song. Pinuyu Mayan is one of the tribes in Taiwan. She was teaching me that song, which actually was from a different tribe uh, that she uh, was born into, but she was teaching me that song. Um, and the right hand, upper corner, uh, beautiful friends of the indigenous, Taiwanese indigenous song and dance troupe, um, formerly called the Aboriginal Song and Dance Troupe, but they since changed the name. Um, but they, so that group is actually of, of young people from all different tribes throughout Taiwan. And they have, you know, come together and, and perform their traditional music um, and, and call upon elders from their own tribes to teach them. So it's a beautiful group that I was able to connect with and, and they took me in and brought me uh, to their, all their uh, different villages. And, um, and in the left-hand corner is Zhang Zhe Gui, who is one of my uh, teachers of the Taiwanese moon lute, which I'll, I'll pull out later, and uh, Chen Yin, who is another teacher uh, of mine, uh, and then on the right, Zhu Ding Sun, uh, who has passed away. Unfortunately, he was another teacher. So, um, yeah, so the, the journeys to Taiwan, I went back and forth. Um, they were so rich, and, and really, the way they, I was learning from them was just they would sit in front of me and play and sing and they would say you know in mandarin they would say copy me you know <laughs> do like me and and so i i you know it's i started calling it tracing the voice just as artists you know they use tracing paper to to learn from their favorites picasso or you know red or whoever so i started just considering it similar to tracing the voice. And um, so another uh, important uh, recording that I heard when I, when I got to Taiwan uh, was that this um, beautiful farmer um, legend named Chen Da. And 
And, and again, this is why the work of ethnomusicologists is so important, uh, because Chanda was kind of discovered uh, when he was already in his 50s, 60s, by these scholars, Taiwanese scholars, and, um, and then they recorded him. And then he kind of became famous as, a, as an icon, especially at that time, um, Taiwan was trying to distinguish themselves from China and it was ongoing. But um, so he became like, you know, for all the, the college students, he was he became like an icon of Chinese independence. And, um, and my cousin had told me about his music. And, uh, and then and that's how I found out about the, the moon lute or the guat kim in Taiwanese. It's called guat kim. Um, it literally means moon instrument or moon thing. <laughs> um, Yue qin is the Mandarin way you would say it, moon instrument. So um, I'm just going to play a touch of his uh, this recording of his beautiful voice. So here we go. Mm -hmm. And this is on a convert. Well, it's on a, on a recording that I purchased, uh, so it is it is findable. But she did know Chen Da. She knew her as a little uh, girl because her parents were friends with Chen Da, um, and they all lived in this the township of Hengchun in southern Taiwan. So. Too busy running around, and 
She's like, five minutes a day, five minutes a day. <laughs> but um, so this is, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm actually just kind of showing you my process. Um, um, again, tracing the voice, absorbing the energy, acknowledging my teachers. Um, and uh, so here, I'll just do a, a verse that she taught me, uh, different lyrics than what she just sang. So. And the meaning is, um, the first hardship is the axe and the knife. The second hardship is the basket and the rope. Poor mother and poor father climbing up and down the curved mountain and the narrow road. There's nothing we can do. So that's the translation. Hmm. 
<laughs> interesting. And then, she, you know, of course I'm translating, but, but in Taiwanese she said, you should, you know, play, you can play my way first, and then your way, <laughs> and that's, that would be great, you know, like, like yeah, I mean, she was giving me this idea, you know, this is how you can do it in a concert, but, um, so yeah, I think that dialogue and kind of, hey, what do you think of this, you know, that is so <coughs> important, I think, as you're doing field work, uh, as any of us are, are out there in the field and, and searching and trying to answer all these questions we have, you know, I think that dialogue with your teachers, with the community, is is everything. So, uh, just wanted to walk you into that that process, um, and I might skip ahead. Uh, well, I'll give you a touch of what this became a piano. So I added this. And then this is even more kind of searching and stretching, experimenting. Um, and this was that song in the context of a theatrical piece. My fir again, first experiment in 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 finding the drama in the music. Uh, and this is a co-creation with a Brazilian writer named Patricia Magalhães. So I was mainly singing in Portuguese, but then this part I sang in Taiwanese. So I'll play a little bit. <laughs> and I should say the story is about um, the first emperor of China, uh, Da Yu, the great Yu, Yu the Great, um, who saved China from flooding, and but also um, ended up leaving his wife and who later gave birth to a son that they conceived of like in a five day period. So, um, so, and I found out about the story just from again, hanging out in Taiwan <laughs> uh, with my translator and we were drinking a tea called, named after this Yu the Great. And I said, oh, this tea is so good. And the woman who was friends with my translator, she, uh, was very bitter. Um, she was. She actually had lost her husband and was taking care of her father. I said, "This tea is so good." She said, "Yes, it's named after you, the great." And, you know, and she said, uh, "But he left his wife and, <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and never came back." You know. Um, so, so then I. Uh, it turns out I had a friend in China who I was learning uh, Shuo Chang with. He was a Chinese singer, also learning the same tradition I was learning. And it turns out his name was, he had Yu, Yu in his name. So then he told, Liu Yu was his name. So he told me the whole story. And anyway, this came out of all of that, and it wouldn't have happened without hanging out. <laughs> so, and the Japanese dancer is named uh, Satoshi Haga, who's been a longtime collaborator. So he's kind of, right now he's embodying uh, Yu the Great, measuring, and I'm the very upset. Uh, abandoned. Finding grants to do this, I was 
I just knew I had to go there, and so I was just finding finding grants and uh, to help me get there. So um, and writing music at the same time, and um, so it finally became time that my mom felt it was safe for me to go to Timor, and. Um, so you'll see these old photos. She was one of 13. She was the oldest of 13 <laughs> kids. And um, these are old photos of her in her youth. Um, she did end up, because of the war with Indonesia, her father, my grandfather, sent her to Taiwan to study uh, high school and later college. Um, and he kind of cleared out the whole family. And so that's why most everyone on mom's side is in Darwin and some once one uncle in Sydney and one auntie in Melbourne, but most everyone's in Darwin. And some have since moved back to East Timor. So, um, and, oh, so, so now we're going to jump into uh, a series of field work. I'm going to kind of skip around. Um, and these were all taken starting 2010 through 2014. Um, and Two years of that, I was on my Fulbright, mainly in Indonesia, but I was going back and forth to Timor because it was very close. So, um, we're going to go through. So this is a beautiful ceremony, um, actually for São Pedro, uh, because Timor was colonized by Portugal for uh, 500 plus years. Um, they, you know, they, what happened with this ritual which was, an, you know, their atomist um, ritual, the missionaries had mixed, mixed. And uh, so they, they made this ritual the same day as the birthday of San Pedro, San Pedro. Um, but they still retain their songs. So, um, so you'll see, this is a fishing ritual, and they have a small boat, and they, they bring it down, you'll see, to the ocean, and then the real fishermen go out and and uh, get the real fish. Everyone has a feast, and then there is a mass, a Catholic mass, right after. Um, so this is the morning. <laughs> and all they could send were recordings of like um, kind of Portuguese songs with Timorese lyrics. And I had I just had to go there to be able to hear this and see this. And um, so I'm going to skip ahead more. This was what my Sindin teacher uh, in Java, um, 